Hi, Stoya here with Rich Juice React. Together, we are Slate.com's How to Do It Sex Advice column. And we are live wherever you're watching us. <laughs> no matter where. How's it going? Good. I love that cover art with the two of us facing the center. It looks like we're in a fight <laughs> or about to fight. <laughs> Even though our chats are usually... Our chats are usually just like, oh, good point. I didn't <laughs> totally. Think of that. Yes. We tend to affirm each other unless pictured. <laughs> How is uh, 2021 treating you so far? Um, You know, my roommate and I drove out to a love hotel in the Poconos and took some dirty pictures, which was like awesome. As you do. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 2021 contains some joy. I love yeah. a love hotel. Oh, they're so tacky. I love them. Yeah. There should, there should be like a coffee table book or something. I hate to give away a great idea, but like the, the love hotels of America should be immortalized in hardback. I will try to find the artist who emailed me about such a project to put the two of you in touch. Cause I want yeah. this to happen but I don't want to do the work. Yeah, I would love to. Oh my God. I would do any number of things. A podcast, a book, take, uh, just let me at the Love Hotels of America. Amazing. Yeah. Then I'm literally going to write it down. Otherwise I will forget. Great. Awesome. Great. I'm back. Um, should we, should we read a question? Yes. So we have some questions that we've, that we're working on. So we're just going to read them and then shoot the shit as we do. You want me to read the first one? Um, yes, but first okay. let's remind people that they can submit questions live and we will answer them right now unless they're terrifying, in which case you will be ignored. Yes. So yes. don't be scared, but also don't scare us. Yes. Happy yes. medium. I'll start with the first one on our list. I'm a straight woman who's been living alone ever since my husband went to quarantine with his chronically ill mother in May to take care of her. I'm working full time from home and have formed a bubble with four friends who live together nearby. I go over to their place a couple of times a week to have dinner and watch a movie, and it has been the only thing keeping my sanity tethered, as well as the only true human contact I have these days. My problem is that after having known one of these friends for several years in a completely platonic manner, it's like a Rubik's Cube suddenly clicked into place in my brain a couple of months ago and said, you have to fuck this man. I have become fully sexually obsessed with him. I am sure he has no clue, thankfully. It is torture to be around him. I am so horny all the time. And all I can think is about fucking him, which will never happen since my husband and I are monogamous. I had to go to the bathroom in the middle of a movie to rub one out just so I could focus. We were watching Selma. <laughs> the only I, I solution. Don't know, I don't know what Selma is. It's, it's, a, it's a period piece, a civil rights period piece about a, a famous march that uh, Martin Luther King spearheaded. Um, so not sexy. Not sexy. No, it's okay. it's not. There's not a, a thing about it that's sexy. I would say uh, maybe some of the actors are good looking, but it's not a sexual movie at all. It's okay. not the point. So that just underlines how horny she is. The only solution I can think of is to stop seeing him, but that would mean cutting off my support system. I'm sure this quarantine or loneliness induced insanity will dissipate once things are back to normal. But in the meantime, I am miserable. It's exhausting trying to hide my obsession when I'm over there. I can't focus at work. I spend my nights searching Pornhub for actors who look like him. And I even came up with a plan to casually get a friend who dated him to tell me what his dick is like so I could buy a dildo that resembles it before realizing this is truly fucking creepy, but also I still might do it. This isn't normal, right? Is there a way to, I don't know, kill my libido or something? I haven't been able to talk to anyone about this since I can't further burden my husband and I can't tell any friends in case it gets back to this man in question who would no doubt be mortified. 
well, in a way, I feel like that mortification might be useful here. Oh, do tell. Well, just because like it would, it would, it, you know, if he was mortified, then it would absolutely crush the possibility of this ever happening. And it might, you know, lead to a chain reaction of her realizing the futility of this. Um, but I, I, you know, I feel like this is just like, like, what do you do when you want to do something that you can't busy yourself, uh, meditate it away, find, yeah. you know, what can you, yeah. if you can't do something, you can't do something, you know? Yeah. I wonder if it would be possible for her to sexually exhaust herself. Um, Kind of like a more extreme version of like that trope with young men going on a date and they jerk off first so they don't immediately ejaculate. Um, but like exhausting herself, like to the point where you're like, actually, no, thank you. I do not want another orgasm. Um, I don't know if that's possible for her. I don't know if she has the time to do that before she sees this guy. But like pent up libido certainly seems to be part of it. And I, I don't think she'd be having this issue to the degree she is if she were with her husband. And, you know, there are certain things you could theoretically do to alter your libido, such as take antidepressants, you know, SSRIs. Um, I don't, I would kind of advise against that because A, that's like super off label. Uh, you're, you're actually taking a pill for a side effect that is considered negative by the majority of people who take them. And also, I mean, you know, theoretically you'd bounce back once you stop taking them, but I just feel like mixing with your body and brain chemistry for a temporary relief, you know, isn't really something you want to get into it's an option. I don't necessarily think it's a good one. Yeah. Well, also like decrease in libido is not the only side effect. Come on, Hicks. There are exactly. a lot of side effects. Um, so I, I wouldn't recommend it either. <laughs> and then I wonder if not just, maybe not so much divulging as I previously, as I previously suggested, but would, flirtation or banter somehow relieve this i mean it could make it worse but could it take the edge off to engage with him on some completely safe harmless ha 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 i think you're hot level i mean also i think i think acknowledging it it's it's a risky move given that this is her entire social bubble. Um, but sometimes just like airing, like, hey, I feel this way. I have no intention to act on it. But like sometimes just discussing it. And that gives the other person a chance to say, oh, it wouldn't work for me either, which could help our writer stick to the path that they want to walk down. Yeah, yeah. Maybe come back to Earth a little bit because... She's in a situation where she wants something she can't have. So she's got to do something because it seems like she's driving herself crazy here. Yeah. Also, you do have to be very careful because of COVID. But speaking to the bubble, making sure everyone's okay with it, and having contact with another bubble that's also okay with it like that's it's not as safe makes me a little nervous um but she might she might want to branch out into other social groups as well yeah yeah i think i think i could qualify as harm reduction yeah like I don't, I really don't like anyone being isolated right now. Yeah. Um, it, Especially it's, at this point. I mean, we're going on a year. Yeah, and it's it's so hard. Like even Steve and I have each other, and he has a few other people that he sees. But 
it's um it's really difficult for people who are super social yeah it's rough I, I did not think that in 2021 I would be saying, hey, if you could just have a lot less sex so yeah. you're not in the air with people, like. <laughs> Absolutely insane. But, you know, I, the, the thing, too, that, like, I find myself reminding people who are asking quarantine questions as they still are is that there really is a light at the end of the tunnel now, at least for this crisis. I mean, who knows what tomorrow will bring. But you just got to hold on for a little bit longer. It sucks. It has sucked. But we're more than halfway through by any measure, if not entering like the final quarter. You know, it just, it sort of, at this point, it's up in the air as to like when enough people will be vaccinated for something like herd immunity. But it's coming. It's really soon. So keep your eye on the prize. The light at the, the yeah. light at the end of the tunnel. New York just opened up another category of people who are eligible for vaccination. Like progress is happening, um, yeah. which I think is super super useful to remind ourselves of. Um, I've written before and gotten some fantastic advice. Oh, awesome! I love to hear it. Yeah. yeah. Now I'd like advice for a problem that I'm sure a lot of women would love to have. How do I get my husband to focus more on himself during sex? My husband is so focused on getting me off that he sometimes has performance anxiety, which gives me anxiety if not everything is working fast enough. I'd like him to focus on his own body and what he's feeling. That will surely help us both enjoy the experience together. It's a delicate subject because he tries so hard. I don't want to sound critical, but I don't want sex to feel like something we both have to accomplish either. So a column I just turned in, um, there was a woman who didn't know how to handle her girlfriend's lack of interest in receiving sexual attention and orgasm. And it's just been this like recurring theme for a few years professionally and personally, where I keep running into people who are super, super, super concerned about the female orgasm and it's wonderful, but they're putting so much pressure on themselves. And then like, as a woman, you feel pressure to have what, like, it's like, oh God, if I don't have an orgasm, this person's gonna feel like a failure and be sad. And like, it's just a lot and I don't think it's all necessary. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny how like by giving, sometimes people are giving you a problem, basically. <laughs> um, I, you know, I have two sort of distinct thoughts about this. One being, it could just be that he's a giver. You know, there are people who are essentially oriented that way, where they would just rather perform on somebody else than worry about themselves. However, if, if he does seem to enjoy being played with himself, I think that like this could be presented as, let's try something new tonight. Let's focus on you. You know, mm -hmm. I... You know, just like you like to get me off, I want to get you off. I want to do this thing and see if that kind of starts a trend within the relationship. You know what you can do for me? Let me do whatever I want to you. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of, yeah. Kind of, I mean, it's not exactly reverse psychology, but it's kind of like working with his pleasure, what he responds to in a way that turns it around back on his body let's see if that mm -hmm. works yeah absolutely um i don't know if there's much else to go over on that one yeah no i don't i don't think so i think it's a i think it's a matter really it, it you know like a lot of these come down to you got to talk about it you got to play around with it so it's going to be a kind of experimental sort of thing um you know i don't think that this subject matter should be 
I don't think you have to worry about being unkind here because it's uh, you're coming from a good place. You know, it's a kind conversation about wanting him to experience the most of sex. So it's not like he's going to get mad about it. Not rationally, at least. Well, yeah, let's hope not. <laughs> okay, let me do the next one. Remember, you can submit questions live to us and we will answer them live pending them being functional questions. I'm sorry, I can't help you with how to remove a circuit board from your laptop. <laughs> uh, me neither, actually. I don't know why I'm <laughs> laughing because that's absolutely true. Um, so I'll read the next one. <laughs> I bet I can do, I can read, um, basically. About a year ago, I discovered my husband watching live cam shows. While I recognize that sex work is valid, for some reason, the live aspect felt too intimate for me, and I asked that there be a hard limit. I also felt touchy as I was lying right next to him and would have been available for sexual activity when I discovered he was watching this. My husband agreed to the hard limit, and we moved on. Over the past 90 days, we've only had sex three times, and I've initiated every single time. This is outside our norm, which is usually twice a week. Then my husband asked me to answer his phone for him when he was busy. And when I ended the call, I noticed his notes. Uh, I'm sorry. I noticed his notes were open and that there was a link to live cams. We fought about it and he insisted that it was an old note and that he's kept our boundary. I've never not believed my husband before, but I don't believe him. It was the top most recent note. And now I find myself wanting to catch glimpses of his phone screens when he's watching something. Is my limit of no live cams unreasonable? Could it be why we are having less sex? How do I approach the trust issue? There is a very good chance that it's why you're having less sex. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and it might be punitive, or it might be that having his sexuality curtailed is making his libido wilt. Yeah, I mean, I do think that there is something to be said, but you know, there's a lot of anti-porn rhetoric, porn is bad for your body and your sex life and blah, 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 which is not very scientific. You know, it hasn't really been proven in a study, but I do think that people sometimes become fixated and, you know, the rest of their life sort of falls to the wayside in a way, whether that's they're yeah. so fixated that they're not getting their work done or they're masturbating instead of having sex. I mean, at a certain point in your development, you only have so much mojo. And if you're using it on yourself, you might just not be horny later. Um, you know, I think even for people with low sexual interest, having space to have solo sex is important. And I don't think it's functional when the partner takes it as something being taken from them. Yes, I agree. And and also like the fact that he was doing this while he could have been having sex with her, I'm sure felt shitty, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's rejecting you per se. It means possibly that he's just got this what seems to be a, a very common human interest in novelty. Mm -hmm. And that is exciting to people, you know, you, you gotta kind of keep it going. And that's why, you know, having a sexual relationship with someone over time becomes a bigger challenge that requires a lot of work for a lot of people because they just kind of get used to it and it becomes unexciting to them. You know, Esther Perel talks about how intimacy and eroticism are at odds for so mm -hmm. many people. And, and I think that that's true. So, you know, I understand taking that personally, but I don't think it needs to be taken as personally as maybe she is. There is an explanation that doesn't necessarily shut her out. Uh, you know, theoretically, unfortunately, she seems to be shut out as well. Yeah, that's um, the fact that she doesn't trust him. 
I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. Because he clearly wants to stay in the relationship and I don't know how people move successfully on from I can't trust you. Like I know people do it. I just don't know how because my wheelhouse is sex and the relationship stuff is sort of this like new area that I'm still trying to catch up in. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like trust can be rebuilt over time. Um, and that's kind of all that you can do. I mean, in a certain way, you can say, okay, I'm going to forgive this indiscretion and just wipe it away and move forward. But that is a big ask. And that's not possible for a lot of people. So those who want to move on do so tentatively, understanding that, you know, you fooled me once. And now we're going to see if you do it again. And if you don't, I'll trust you. I find it kind of strange that he would ask her to touch his phone when evidence of at least seeming evidence of him using something that they talked about him not using was right there to be viewed um, yeah. that i mean he's either like super dumb or uh things aren't caught. what they say yeah or trying to get caught that's true too or he is telling the truth because it's just so absurd that he would ask for her to answer yeah. that. You know what I mean? Like if I'm sneaking, like I, I've been sneaky on my phone before. And in the event that I'm like being sneaky in the past, I have moved on from sort of that kind of sneakiness. But theoretically, if I'm sneaky, uh, I'm like with my phone 24 seven. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, it just, I I feel like our writer has to decide, like, am I going to extend trust again and see what happens? Or am I going to not trust and, like, deal with the fallout from that? And if she goes the trust route, which is the stay in the relationship route, you can't look at the phone. Yeah. You can't do it. You can't ever do it. Yeah, it's very true. Do you think do you think that it's unreasonable for her to have this hard limit on cams? Uh, I have a bit of a long windy answer. Yes, Pix. Come on. Okay, hello. There you go. Um, so on the one hand, it's unreasonable to be upset about your partner masturbating sometimes, I think. Um, but it's also reasonable to have a limit or a squick or a thing that you just can't deal with. And a lot of dating is figuring out if these things we can't deal with and those things they have to have match up well. Um, so unfortunately they didn't work this out before they got married they are now married and it's like so i'm comfortable with this much covid risk and i take this much covid risk and let steve have the whole rest because he's the one who's super social and needs to get out of the apartment. And that's this like balance, right? And in a relationship, you have to go like, oh, I'm upset by this cam thing. Maybe there are feelings that I can sort through and change my perspective and therefore position, maybe not. And my partner, whatever the effect of no cams has had on him is that he doesn't want to have sex with me so like she has to choose what comfortable balance is for her there um and maybe maybe he's me and he never looks at a cam site again right maybe maybe she gets to be steve and like to be clear there are lots of balances that are completely unequal in my favor in my home 
Um, yeah. But like this, this balance, it's, it's less than ideal. And we all have to do it. Like any, any significant relationship, you're going to have to balance things. You're going to have to choose, is my thing more important than their thing? Is their thing more important than my thing? Because sometimes you don't get to have both. Um, and she doesn't get to have her comfort while he has his campsites. And so she, she has to make the choices there. Yeah. I, I think it's completely fair to say, look, we've had this conversation about the campsites. You're saying that you're not using them. Regardless of that, I've noticed a dip in our sexual activity. What's up with that? I'm connecting these things in my head. Prove me wrong. You know, I mean, she laid it out for us rather logically and plausibly. Why not just present that to him in a non-accusatory, here's a thing that I've noticed and here's the thing that is bothering me sort of way. Yeah. So yeah, I've noticed this thing. I'm wondering if it has anything to do with the cam thing. If so, let's talk about it. Yeah, exactly. Oh boy, do you see this in the chat? I do. You know what though? Um, I need to, I'm so sorry. My power cord is not plugged in right now and I'm running out of juice. So uh -oh. uh, we can do that one or we can do the other one. I have an answer to the other one. If you just want to read one, I'll run and get it. And by the time you're done reading, yeah. I'll be back. Yeah, I'll read, uh, I'll read the next one in the what's it thing. I'm a woman in my late twenties and I've recently made things exclusive with my boyfriend of three months. The sex is generally awesome, but there's one thing I can't figure out. During sex, he often requests that I sit on his face to receive oral. This is something new to me that I'd be enthusiastic about if I could figure out how. I'm a regular lifter, I do my squats, and I have strong thighs, but I'm not a small woman. So while I have the body strength to hold myself above him, I can't relax enough to come in that state. I'm always worried I'll crush him. How exactly do other people hold their bodies for this? I'm totally confused by the positioning. A kind of yoga cat or cow pose above him works okay, but our heights don't work to 69, and I'm stuck making eye contact with his belly button. He wants more of a direct sitting position, which I would be into if I could figure out, well, how to do it. Any tips? So are we sure he doesn't want to be smothered? Exactly. To me, if somebody says, sit on my face, that's what they mean. And then you're getting the whole hole. Yeah. Know? Every every time someone's wanted me to sit on their face, which, by the way, is fucking lazy. Um, <laughs> sorry, we get to use the F word tonight. So we I want <laughs> <laughs> but like so like sometimes it's like oh you're just doing this because you don't want to have to like position yourself with me on my back so your face is going to get squished because that's what you get and sometimes it's like oh you want your face squished so like yeah i'm just gonna sit on your face like right. really and then you're really sitting like it's a chair and it's actually kind of comfy but here's something that you can do to like take the load off your ass. If you like sit with your legs tucked essentially so that, you know, your knees are maybe at his neck or his head, you know, depending on where you are, then you're, you're balancing yourself. You're, you're supporting yourself basically on your legs. Your legs are on the bed and, and you're crouching down. So that's a lot less weight than if you were just to like literally like pretend like he's the the bottom of a chair and just sit with, you know, your legs out as though you were sitting on a chair. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, you definitely wanna, hold on. Ooh, a demonstration. You have a I tail? Have, I have a tail. You have a tail. I have a tail, <laughs> I also have. What is it, is it a raccoon? It's a fox, I'm a oh, silver a fox. fox. Silver fox. Yeah, so you're saying one of these. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's a lot easier. If you're trying to do one of these, that's not. You're not happy. You're no, you're gonna exhaust yourself after like a minute. 
Yeah. But another I thing you can do is there's, if there's a headboard or a wall, you can brace your arms there for a little bit of leverage. I find, I, I don't know, to me, like the, you know, not to, you know, insult anybody, you know, for, for their lack of knowledge, because obviously there is no manual to this stuff. But, you know, reading this and to, to me, the you know, the legs, the, the first position that you showed was so obvious to me as to be intuitive that it makes me wonder if they've actually even tried, you know, to experiment with it. Hmm. I also, I wonder if they're doing like a hover thing. Because if you try to hover in the knees bent position, the... Um, it's kind of like the top inside of the kneecap feels strain that can be really uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so nice when we get a mechanical sex question. <laughs> I know, I know. This one was a breeze. So yeah, really? try that. Yeah. All right, um, you want to do the, the one that was submitted live? Oh, yeah. Okay, we've yeah. got a live one coming in. I tried to have sex the other day and ran out of breath before I could nut because all of the hard drugs that were in my system, what can be done about this? Well, this is the what happens when you do hard drugs and you have sex. It's, it makes it functioning difficult. It's more of a what can be not done. Yeah. 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 Um, it, drugs are hard on your body. People love sex and drugs uh, personally sex is enough of a drug for me i prefer sober sex even i'd rather not be stoned on weed when i have sex most of the time because it's a real crapshoot you know i find drugs don't necessarily let me focus on what i want to be focused on they can take my head in all sorts of directions so um you know the price you pay for sex on drugs is that it might not work out for you because you got so much else going on in your head and body. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, if you're feeling, what's that? Because do you say because your body, Yeah. if you want it to let you feel good, you have to be nice to it. Yeah. 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 I mean, also, you know, if you're running out of breath and you're, you feel like you need to take a breather, then ask someone to sit on your face, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or get a glass of water, right? Like yeah. you can like stop having sex, take a minute and then go back to it. It's yeah. not like you only get one insertion. You can Exactly. That, also like there's so much that can be done on your back and not, not just having someone sit on your face, you know? So like if you feel tired, you really can you know, concede the the power mechanics there and just say, okay, I'm going to be laying down on this one. Personally, I like to be comfortable. So I generally like to be laying down having sex, even, you know, not on drugs. After 45 years of pretty happy, basically vanilla sex, we discovered spanking. I am shocked, embarrassed, and puzzled by the fact that I like being spanked and shocked that my husband enjoys spanking me. We are tentatively playing around adding toys to the act. Since my husband deals with ED, this seems to work for both of us. I guess my question is, is it weird to find a kink after so many years? Or how abnormal is it for a loud, bossy woman to enjoy being dominated in bed? To be fair, he even sort of suggested smacking me outside naked. The fight would be epic. I was with her the whole way up <coughs> till the fight would be epic, and now I'm just confused. Yeah, I don't, I don't know who's why there's a fight now, but... Uh, is it like okay. a struggle spanking? Like, oh, first you have to catch me and then you have to hold me down while I wiggle. <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but she's, uh, yeah, her vision, like I I was painted a picture that then the water ran all over and now I actually don't know what she's considering spanking. I, I just, uh, is it normal for a loud bossy woman to enjoy being dominated in bed 
I don't really like the word normal, but Emily Nagoski uses it a lot, so I'm so, okay with it. Um, lots of loud, bossy women. Hello, love and love being dominated in bed. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah. Just you know, and there's not necessarily cause and effect or a way to draw a line between you know waking life and sex, sexual life, but uh, sex can certainly be a space where you can experiment with sensations and uh, sensibilities that don't necessarily, that you don't necessarily get to for whatever reason in a non-sexual space. So, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the reason is, yes, people's outward appearance does not necessarily match what they enjoy in bed. Yeah. And is it normal to discover a new kink? after 45 years? You know, I think that like, yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, it's the, it's, it's, I think what it all comes back to, like we were talking about with the cam guy is novelty, you know, in, in a way, there are definitely people who like, like what they like, and they discover that at an early age, and they like it until they die. But a lot of people have to evolve. You sort of stay engaged by changing. And, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reason that is. And I really just think it's as simple as, like, you <laughs> get bored, you know? Or not even getting bored, but something new is interesting. So, uh, you know, I think that it's completely reasonable to discover something new. Um, and I think it's cool. I think that's great. You know, if more people did, uh, we'd probably, they'd probably be happier and, you know, stay with partners that they feel like they've run their course sexually with, you know? Yeah. Um, so I can, uh, so let's, do you have anything else to say about that? No. <laughs> okay. Moving on. I got yeah, this moving. interesting, I have this interesting etiquette question uh, that I would love to hear you on because I'm kind of going over it in my head. I've been debating it. It's one of, it's, it's preview coming up in a new batch that I would love to hear you about. Awesome. I am a city dwelling cis man in my early forties in a polyamorous marriage with a cis woman around my age. Our marriage is non-sexual and has been for many years. My wife has a long-term boyfriend that stays at his place several times a month. We have no children. My wife and I consider each other to be primary partners due to longevity of partnership, our shared strong connection to our nephews, living together, shared finances, etc. I personally have not had sex in a few years, which I am not happy about. I'm on Tinder and such, looking for someone to date. I vastly prefer dating people to having random encounters. I am perhaps slightly demisexual, I'm well aware that straight men are typically at a disadvantage when it comes to non-monogamy. I'm also not incredibly attractive, though I am tall. I don't have much luck on the dating apps. When I rarely do find someone who is interested, she's often too busy for a relationship, even a secondary one. Also, it must be said that I haven't gone on a date since the pandemic began. I am not planning to until it's over, so for the time being, this is all rather moot. I say on my profiles that I am sober and in a non-monogamous marriage. My wife thinks I should be upfront about not wanting something serious, but not share in my profile specifically that I am married. She thinks it is turning women off. Is it ethical as long as I am clear about not wanting a serious primary monogamous relationship? Is it ethical to leave out the fact that he's married on his profile? Or should I be using Ashley Madison or something similar, though I don't want to meet anyone involved in unethical non-monogamy? I have also wondered if I should not share up front that I am sober, that I might seem unfun. And if I take these things off my profile, at what point should I tell someone first date, second? I welcome your thoughts on this. So the first thing is an easy one. Yes, get rid of sober. Okay, also, yeah. It's 2021. You don't need to be like, hi, I'm sober. You right. can just not order an alcoholic drink eventually they'll figure it out i don't think you need to disclose sobriety yeah anymore. unless he 
Right, unless he absolutely does not want to be in the presence of someone who is drinking, which doesn't seem to be the case, I don't see any reason to disclose that. Yeah, so just cut that one because saying I'm sober feels like it's got to be like this big important thing and maybe they don't want to be around alcohol and like how do you even gently ask? Um, and, you know, the ethics of disclosure, let's get real messy and make it about me for a second. Yes. I use dating apps it. sometimes. I've tried a few. Um I uh, I always have to figure out how to handle the stoya factor, right? Because like obviously I'm not gonna lead with stoya as my username, but people recognize right. me. They do, and they're like, "Hey, stoya, nice to see you. Hope you find someone by." Um, and it's just like, "Oh, thank you." Um, <laughs> sometimes they report me for impersonating myself too. <laughs> Um, which is awkward, but you know, it's this like, well, when, when do I say it? Or if they know about my career, when do they say it? And I, I don't know, like, is it, is it weird to bring it up in the first half hour of the first date? Probably. Um, is it leaving it too long to on the third date? Be like, hey, so I uh, touch people's genitals for money sometimes. Um, also, I do a brisk used panties trade and spend a lot of time having my roommate take pictures of my vagina. Yeah, what do you think? Are you still on board? Okay, great. Um, like, and it's just like, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to say these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. do you just play it by ear every time? Is it just uh -huh. your comfort level? Yeah. Every, so, every so, time based on what was awkward last time, me trying not to replicate it. Although I think it's more like based on whether the person's going to be awkward. Right. Yeah. You kind of feel them out. Yeah. So, you know, I come from uh, people who have a long history of anonymous sex encounters in which nobody knows anything about the other person theoretically, right? You know, like cruising back in the day. That, and that is what is fetishized to a certain degree in these encounters that, you know, that anonymous, you know, unanimity, unanimity or however you say it, whatever. Uh, just that sort of anonymous nature of the encounters is what people like about it. The fact that you're mm -hmm. not disclosing these things and you're not hearing about it from the other people. Um, that said, he wants a little bit more than that. And I would even be totally okay with not disclosing at all. And, you know, like leaving it up to feeling it out as you do all, but he says, I don't want to meet anyone involved in unethical non-monogamy, which means he has a certain expectation there for somebody to be upfront, you know, if. If he wants to know that amount of information from somebody, then I think that he should reasonably be expected to give it. I think so. And the thing about ethics is everyone has their own set of ethics. Yes. Okay, maybe you become a lawyer or a doctor or a psychiatrist, and then you have your profession's ethics to uphold in those contexts. Um, but generally, Every individual human has their own ethics. There's no agreed upon way to do poly. Um, out of the two main poly books that I know of, one one of the co-writers regrets her involvement in parts of it. And the other co-writer is the subject of a lot of criticism from former partners. So like even the people who are claiming to have something figured out it's frequently not what it seems. Um, and there's there's no real standard. You have to act in a way that lets you sleep at night. You have to act in the way that you believe is ethical and search for other people who agree. And, and, and the best way to do that, I think, given his the way that he's living, is to enter a poly group or space that's local to him you know mm -hmm. he said he's city dwelling i believe i'm almost sure that 
city dwelling. So yeah. if he's city dwelling, there is a local poly group. Why isn't he there? Those, those people in that group will be far more understanding of the situation, everything that that means. And the whole you're married thing is like, yeah, no shit, you're married. <laughs> you're at this poly group, you know? So yeah. that's what he should do, I think. I think that's wise, yeah. Yeah. So shall we do this last one real quick? We can try. <laughs> okay. Any advice for working through body image issues? I'm 31, a bisexual cis man with an unconventional body, sunken chest, and some extra breast tissue. I hold myself back from dating slash sex from anxiety. I, you know, I feel like fake it till you make it. Like, you know, you're holding yourself back here. So, you know, if you hold yourself back, you certainly won't be accepted because people won't get a chance to be even around you. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't hold yourself back, then there's a chance you'll be rejected, but there's a chance you won't be. So you're already increasing your odds. Yeah, um, I've dated people with pigeon chests. I've dated people with lazy eyes. I've dated a number of varying degrees of balding people. Um, the only thing that's a problem in that is when they can't stop thinking about it or expressing like, oh, you know, I'm so this and you're so that. And then it's this like weird, like imbalanced thing. And it's just like, can we just be people? Cause I'm personality driven and like energy and intimacy and empathy driven. Um, so, so like really like just try, try to exude a confidence you do not have until it begins to conform to you. Because so much of what makes a person sexy, especially men in my experience, experience is how they carry themselves. You know, that can, that can certainly flip the coin. That can certainly push someone mm -hmm that maybe aesthetically doesn't excite me at first glance. And then you talk to them and you're like, oh, wow, you're really sexy, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not gonna be perfect. Like not everybody is gonna be an objective 10, you should be modeling. That's just not what the point is, but everybody's got something that's sexy about them, you know, like every single person. So it's just about sort of, you know, finding that and pushing that to the front, you know? Yeah. 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 Focus on your assets. Do whatever exactly. you can with them. Exactly. Yeah. And it's total Jedi mind tricks too. It's total like pushing through and it sucks and it might be uncomfortable. But like I said, the alternative is worse. The alternative is inaction. So do something. All right. Um, I think that's all of our questions for tonight. That's it. Yeah. It was good to see your face. It's always good to see your face, Stoya. And thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in and for reading this column that we love to do so much. Um, yeah. It's truly, truly a pleasure. And it's, you know, as good as the first time, I would say. <laughs> I feel like it gets better because we keep getting more and more interesting questions. It's true. It's true. I got one from a guy who enjoys CPR in an erotic way. Wow. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to get a, a source for this. <laughs> I'm like, me with my mail order high school diploma and my porn career, I can say, I really think that's dangerous. But if I can get someone with some licensing or something, that's going to look a lot better. So I go to the internet and I start calling CPR schools. I'm like, hi. I go by Stoya, half of Slate's How to Do It Sex Device column. I got a question. It's a bit atypical. It's from a guy who eroticizes CPR. Hold, please. <laughs> no, we can't help you with that. Okay. <laughs> so then, then I was like, all right. Uh, I, I left a message at another place. And I was like, all right, I'm going to call 311. And the woman <laughs> picked up. And I explained. And she's like, wow. And I'm like, yeah. 
And I got to get a doctor to tell me if this is as dangerous as I think it is. And she's like, yeah, yeah, the peace will be a lot stronger. And I'm like, yeah, it will. So that's um, a New Yorker for you. And she's like, all right, Department of Health and Mental Health. I'm going to shoot you over there. And I get on the phone with them and I explain and the guy hangs up on me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I email like the editor in charge of us. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I'm having a really hard time getting sources. Do you have anyone? And he said, LOL, I love that you're trying to get someone on record for this. <laughs> and then a guy who's been teaching CPR for 23 years called me back. Incredible. And I'm like, over the moon. And it is so wonderful to have a reason to go research these things. Yes. And when you have a column, an expert is a lot more likely to respond to you. Totally. And then also like you're absorbing the shame on the writer's behalf, but in a way that's not personal for you. Like, yeah, it sucks t for someone to hang up in your face, but you totally understand why. And it's no reflection of you. You're just trying to do your job. So I think by like separating that sort of separation actually kind of neutralizes and allows you to push forward and actually get the answer that would be impossible if, or very, very difficult if this were your issue. So yeah yeah it's yeah. a really fun gig it really is i love it and uh yeah thanks for everybody <laughs> thank you have a good night